Yeah, so no, I'm pretty much done with it. It's right over here. Wow, you put lights in it? Wait, no. What? What is going on? Hey there, thanks for stopping by. I'm Brett. Welcome to On Hand Art. When I was in my 20s, I made this puzzle box. And not to sound too melodramatic, but it was very much a metaphor for how I saw life at the time. A relatively simple puzzle on the outside with a deceptively complex puzzle on the inside. It's also rough, not pretty, unfinished, just like my life at the time. But as I've gotten older, my view of life and my metaphor for it has changed, so I think it's time to revisit this piece. After some design work in Inkscape, I made a quick paper mock-up to check the actual size when you hold it in your hand. Then I grabbed my templates and materials. There will be an inner box and the outer puzzle pieces. So I have one set of templates for this pegboard and another for the puzzle pieces. Oh, and I grabbed my dust mask and goggles because this stuff makes a crazy mess. There is actually a much faster way to cut out this pegboard, but I want to show you how I use my Dremel tool to do it. I think that's a more accessible way for most people. And then I'll show you the other method near the end of the video. You'll notice that I also switched from a mini circular saw blade to a diamond cutoff wheel because this material is way harder than you might think. Then to hold the panels together, I cut little blocks of basswood, and then I'm gluing them on with a nice helping of Mod Podge. To make my life easier, I actually broke this glue up into stages, and this will help me to make sure that the blocks are right up against the edge of the base, and that way there won't be any gaps between them and the side panels when I go to glue them on. And then once those are dry, I can then glue on the side panels. Again, I'm using a lot of glue and going back to fill in any of those little gaps as I put the sides on. And then to hold everything in place, I'm grabbing all the heavy squares I can find, including these little machinist squares, and then also the square from my adjustable square. And this part of the box is purely a framework and it gets completely covered. So it doesn't really have to be pretty as much as it has to be square. This is also where any of the mechanics will go, especially the locking mechanism. So the, all those little blocks will act as spacers. As I said earlier, I have a second set of templates for the buttons. I'll spray adhesive of those to these quarter inch basswood sheets. And that means opening the back door and moving my little candle powered heater out of the way because as you know, flames and spray mix way too well together. And I'll spray this away from you. I don't want to get it in your face or on my lens. Getting those first templates on straight against the edges of the board means fewer cuts, but it also means a lot less cleanup. But also it allows me to get the other templates on the same panel using less material. Now the top and bottom templates have to go on the second sheet because they're too big, but the same thing applies here, getting them straight against those edges. To cut out these side panels, I grabbed my dust mask and safety goggles and started with a fiberglass cutoff wheel. That didn't work very well at all, so I went back to my diamond cutoff wheel, which worked much better. But you can also use a knife or a coping saw. Now those options will probably be hard on your hands, and personally I've never gotten a straight cut with a coping saw, but you can try that. The trick to keeping your cuts straight is to take shallow passes. Now it might take three or four passes, but you'll end up with nicer cuts. So it really pays to be patient. It's also gonna put a lot less stress on your Dremel tool. And as I've learned over the last few years, these new Dremels are kind of garbage, so they can't take a lot of abuse. I quickly learned that simply cutting through the template with my Dremel resulted in torn and moving paper to try and manage. Instead, I etched the cut lines into the wood with a box cutter. And even though I kept these templates on to keep the pieces straight, I actually removed them before cutting. After peeling them off, I discovered a few straight cut lines that needed gluing. Now, those repairs actually bought me a little time because I was getting nervous about starting the cuts. 
But with all of those cuts fixed and all my cut lines in place, I drilled the peg holes. Now one thing I would have done differently would be to build up drill bit sizes. Going straight to this half inch drill bit like this caused a bunch of tear out that I had to fill in later. I tried to prevent that by drilling into a waste block and to drill almost all the way through and then come back from the back side, which helped a little bit, but not enough. Oh, and if you've ever wondered what to do with those foam brush handles, here's an idea for you. They're going to become the pegs, and I'll show you that later, but for now, that's one hole down, ten to go. With all those holes drilled, I moved on to cutting the puzzle button pieces. Say that five times fast. This process almost took me eight hours, uh, over about three days. And as I said earlier, there's a faster way to do this, but I'll show you that later. You also might have noticed that I switched my Dremel tools, and this is the one I've had since the early 90s. It's outlasted three other supposedly great new models, including the one I had earlier until it burned out. Now, it just doesn't have the speed that they say you're supposed to with cutoff wheels. Otherwise, it works great, so if you can find a used one, that might be the way to go for you. And if you're wondering how I kept track of all those pieces, here you go. Painter's tape to the rescue. But with all my buttons, it's about 70 buttons cut, it's time to sand them. After a quick sand on all their little sides, I'm rounding the edges by just dragging them back and up across this 100 grit sandpaper. For the peg holes, I wrapped a foam brush handle in 100 grit sandpaper just to make sure to keep them round. And then to cut down on the number of buttons, I made some of them just to look like two separate buttons with a seam in the middle. I'm giving the inner box a coat of white. Now, I screwed up here because I meant to use gesso first. It's not too big a deal, it just means more expensive white paint than I'd like to use. And because I didn't use gesso, I actually had to come back over with a second coat because the first one doesn't stick as well. Then I moved on to painting the buttons. I gave all the buttons a coat of gesso because I remembered this time. And when they are dry, it's back to being stuck to a sheet of blue tape. My original concept was to cover the box with a bunch of false but pressable buttons. I couldn't get those to work, so to stick to my original vision, I wanted the buttons to stand off the inner box just a little bit. To do that, I made standoffs with a bunch of popsicle sticks, which I glued up and then set under some weights to press them together. And then I cut off about 70 of those pieces with my diamond cutoff wheel, which is actually getting pretty dull by now. But those just get glued to the bottom of the buttons and then actually re-glued when some of those layers separated. Getting these first two buttons in the right place is critical to getting the rest of them spaced right and in the right places themselves. To get the overhang just right and to keep them square, I made a quick template from a few extra standoffs and a scrap of basswood. And most importantly, I'm practicing patience with this process, which I think is a bit of growth for myself. There are a lot of metaphors in these buttons, from the choices we're presented with every day to the dead ends we once thought of as choices. But the one that I first thought of was how we all see these possibilities around us, but most of them are not for us. And as much as we might envy other people's choices and opportunities, there's usually a different choice or opportunity waiting for us. But that's really only what I see. You're going to find your own interpretation. Okay, to get the right spacing, I'm dry fitting these puzzle piece buttons, and then I went around gluing them down. And like I showed you earlier, I'm making the little round buttons from the wooden handles of old foam brushes I've collected over the years. I'm cutting them with my trusty diamond cutoff wheel to pre-measured lengths. That way they'll stick just a little bit above the puzzle piece buttons. I only needed 11, but I'm going to cut a few extras so that I can choose the best ones. And then I sanded the tops round, painted them with some gesso, 
And then the final coat is a mix of crimson with literally a dot of black just kind of loosely mixed in. I want them to be bright while also having some depth and character of imperfection. So while the crimson is the main color and it really comes forward, you'll still get little streaks and swirls of the Mars black. While those are drying, I'm coating the box with a couple of coats of titanium white that I've mixed with a gloss gel medium. And then sticking with my vision, the box is shiny and bright, but it's not perfect. You get to see the brush strokes and the specks where the paint was just a little too heavy. In other words, there's beauty, but it's also that kind of layer of unavoidable imperfection and messiness that just kind of comes along with living. Once all that paint was dry enough, I glued all these little red buttons in place. You know, I'd really be interested in hearing your interpretation of what these are for you. Because for me, they are all at once little bright spots in life, or red flags, the little things that are exciting, add interest, and are both happy and challenging. I made the latch from a cake message stand because it has a built-in spring. I'm also using the spark plug wire spring from a 2004 Grand Marquis. It's not using it anymore, so I figured why not. Rest in peace, buddy. I just stapled a little bit of the spark plug cable spring to the button that I'll then glue to the rest of the latch. The latch is simply a bamboo skewer that I cut to length and carved a notch in the end with my Dremel tool. Then I bent the cake flag as the latch hook and screwed it to the wall of the box. And then I'm holding the skewer in place with a bit of copper wire so it doesn't slide down the cake flag when I press the button. And here's what it looks like under the button, and I'll stop the shaking so you can actually see that. Before I can finish the latch, I have to cover the inside of the lid with its final fluffy felt finish. And if you think that looks like too much Mod Podge, this is actually my second try, because the felt soaked up all the glue and fell off the first time. But once that's dry, I can then add the final piece of the latch, which is this, this little eye screw. The hinge is four more eye screws with a metal rod I got from who knows where. It took a little effort to get that rod through the eye screws, but that just means it won't work its way out. And now we're on to the inner puzzle. I'm making it from an inch thick basswood plaque, and that's because it was cheaper than the other inch or so thick options that I had. But after rough cutting two basic blocks with my jigsaw, I'll glue them up and let them dry overnight. To even up the sides, I'm using 80 grit sandpaper and my little palm sander. Now this part went actually pretty fast, and basswood is pretty soft, but these were really uneven to start with. But because I'll be painting them, they don't really need to be buttery smooth, but I do want to get rid of as much of that middle seam as I can. But as promised, the faster way to cut all of this out is with an oscillating cutter. But honestly, even as long as it took me with the Dremel, if I had to choose just one tool, I get a lot more use out of my Dremel. That said, my 30-year-old basic model has outlasted three of the newer, higher-end ones. And I've heard of a lot of people who say that they do purposefully look for gently used older models, so maybe that's the way to go. The other thing I discovered is that this cutter did a great job of just really just jamming that sawdust into the grain of the wood, and I had to use a wire brush to get it all out before I even started sanding. But with a few coats of the same titanium white and gloss medium, I'm finished. So here's the finished piece. The overall metaphor this box represents for me is that even with all its challenges, there's still a lot of beauty in life. You truly do take the good with the bad. Well, that, and once you figure out the puzzle to opening it, you find you're just getting started as you're rewarded with a more complex puzzle. It's up to you to decide if you see that new puzzle as an interesting challenge or an upsetting obstacle. All things I'm still working on myself. But hey, look, if you enjoyed this video, please let me know by hitting the like button and subscribing. Not only would it mean a lot to me, but I'd love to have you as part of the On Hand Art community. And if you like this video, I'll leave a link to one that YouTube thinks you'll like too. But thanks for watching, and remember, you are creative.